Um, hello, hello, good evening, my friends. Malkharjikalair or Fudnakrenya. Just finished the dinner. Sorry about that. I'm going to chew a bit of gum for a moment. How is everybody keeping? Welcome to Live Irish Myths. This is episode number 214, even. Uh, I hope you're all having a very good evening, slash morning, slash afternoon, slash night, wherever you happen to be in the world. I'm very self conscious now. Um, Last night in Ireland, you may have seen, we had quite a spectacular display of Aurora Borealis, Northern Lights. I was at Newgrange, I did get a picture, but Cloud came in and uh, I didn't see much after that. There are some spectacular pictures uh, on various pages and accounts on Facebook today, if you've been lucky enough to see some of those, and some news reports as well. Uh, the best uh, aurora in a decade, um, according to reports. Um, I think I missed the best of it. But as I say, cloud was a significant um, barrier to the enjoyment of it. Uh, Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is the first in the house tonight. Look at that. Second Is that the second week in a row? Probably more than the second week in a row. Fenella Egan is in the house. Hello, Fenella. You're very welcome to Live Irish Mits. Hope you enjoy the live stream. Rex Fortenbury says hello out there. And hello right back. Joe Butler, Auntie Joe is saying hello from Colorado. Tom King is saying, can someone switch on the light, please? We're in the dark. I'm, I'm sure you can. Um, uh, what's the phrase? I'm, I'm sure you can improvise something, Tom. I mean, you do have a, uh, you do have a flame burning out there. Elaine is boasting about how it's 22 Celsius. Oh, my God. Yeah, I think it's it's probably about six degrees here. Uh, Fenella says hi from Sligo, beautiful part of the world. And uh, some nice uh, views of the Aurora there last night. Hope you got a chance to see that. Wayne Bird is in the house. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is well. Beautiful photos of the Aurora Borealis. Yeah, I've been enjoying uh, keeping an eye on uh, all of that today. Um, seems some people got a really spectacular display. Maureen O'Leary is in northwest Minnesota, snowy and blowy, but temperatures this week from minus 5 Fahrenheit to 32 above. Woohoo, sending warm weather your way, Ireland. Yeah, we're not just out of the winter just yet, but uh, we have it far better than other places by the looks of it. Heather Marie Leaning is in the house. Evening, Anthony and Tua. Hi, Heather uh, Falchi. Uh, the viewer in Grants Pass, Oregon, is undoubtedly Anne Scott Doherty, who it is. Snow for third week in a row. Very unusual for here. I just said it, didn't I? We're not. Some people are not out of the woods yet when it comes to uh, winter and spring and all that. Um, hope that you're making plenty of snowmen. And, or at least that you're safely inside and you have plenty of food in the uh, in the presses and in the fridge. Uh, Ali is saying hello from Tucson. It was rainy last night and beautiful today. with a slight chill to the breeze. Perfect for cozy robe and tea while listening. That's how I picture everyone. Warm cups of something in their hand and uh, wrapped up nicely in blankets or robes or whatever uh, with the feet up for the episode. Helen Hurst Chatter is in the house. Hello, Helen. As is Irish Technical Thinker. And that's Marcus. Good evening to both of you. Constance Kavanagh says, greetings. Hello, Constance. You're very welcome to the live stream watching on YouTube. Don't forget if you haven't done so already, if any of you are watching on YouTube, do subscribe to the channel and get notifications of upcoming live streams and uh, videos. Alan Hoskins, good evening, good afternoon, good morning from Ballina, North Tipperary. Oh, Paul is, oh, hang on. Have you decided which side of the river you're on? After I said it last week, I hope. I was only, pardon me, I was only winding you up, Alan. It's perfectly acceptable, isn't it, to say Ballina, Killaloo. You don't have to be from one or the other. From near Bale Baru on the banks of the Shannon. Barb Jordan is in the house. Hello, Barb. Who's been watching all the all the way since the first episode, isn't that right? Uh, Tom King is saying uh, hello there, Anthony and friends of the two. Well, it's a lovely evening at the forge. Hope all in good fettle. Yeah. Keep an eye for breaks in the cloud, Tom. You might get a chance to see the northern lights. Although um the latest indications are that it won't be as good as last night, even if the clouds were to clear. 
But so long as the clouds are in the way, we'll see nothing. Archaeostronomy database says we are about halfway between Imbolc and the Equinox. Brilliant. And of course, the Equinox, the point at which here, uh, well, the spring Equinox, uh, the point at which the sun uh, crosses the celestial equator uh, and uh, rises north of, afterwards, rises north of east and sets south of west. Longer days ahead, folks. Brilliant stuff. Spike Willow's in the house. Jigwich, uh, Spike, welcome to the live stream. John Main is in a very wet and cold San Francisco. I, I, I scarcely believe it, uh, John, but uh, you'll have to go to Texas or maybe somewhere in the Mediterranean to get the warmer weather. Karen Fayo Lachlan says, greetings to her. The wind is a blowing big time today in Colorado. Well, keep safe and keep warm, Karen. Beautiful stuff over era last night, says uh, Rex. You're not wrong. Sue Prenter, hearing you loud and clear. Missed the lights last night, but love those that have been shared. Hello, all. Good evening to you, Sue. You're very welcome. Uh, Grace is saying hello from Arizona. Grace is a clopper Ironside. Grace, you're very welcome. Uh, a very good afternoon to you from here in the Boyne Valley in Ireland. Adina Spark says hello to everyone. Finally, a break in our killer winds. 50 miles plus, 50 miles per hour plus over the last few days. Wow. Alva Kelly, uh, Banachti Mutosaka, um, Mutus uh, to do with myth, but Mutosaka, Mithers, Mithflixers, Alva, you're very welcome. Um, Spike Willow says it was raining here. You're not going to see Aurora if it's raining, that's for sure. Pat Maddox says hello from Cincinnati, Ohio, 66 degrees. We have to do the calculations for the Europeans. That is eight, almost 19 Celsius. That's nice. Send a little bit of that our way. Maureen O'Leary was wishing uh, some warmth upon us. Well, I think Cincinnati can spare a few degrees by the looks of it. Um, Kevin Williams is joining us from Melbourne in Australia. A very good morning to you, Kevin. Happy Tuesday to you. A very good morning uh, from, well, a good evening from the Boyne Valley to all of our uh, kin and our followers and our friends in Australia. Great to see you here. Mariana Dunn is in Overcast, Alexandria, Virginia. I hope everyone's well. All doing fine, Mariana. And uh, maybe you'll get a chance to see Aurora. I believe they were seen over as far south as Colorado uh, last night. Um, so that should be interesting. Who is in snowy Ontario? That is Sheila Gunn. A very good afternoon to you, Sheila, and uh, stay warm. Uh, Barb Jordan, yes, the very first, remember it well. Yeah, there you go, Barb. I was going to say, have you got nothing better to be doing at your time? Uh, it's a joke, of course. <laughs> Caitlin Moon says, a very uh, good evening from chilly Dublin. Hello, Caitlin, you're very welcome, uh, as always, and I uh, hope. You're keeping warm. Uh, Pat Lake O'Connolly is in Vermont. Good afternoon to you, Pat. Thanks for joining us here on Live Irish Mints. And McCallum, hope everything's in good form, fine form. We've had all kinds of weather thrown at us this winter. The latest was an ice storm a few days ago. Lots of damage from falling tree limbs and branches. But the next day, it was like a beautiful winter wonderland with all the icicles hanging on the trees and bushes. Today, it was freezing rain. I'll tell you, I'll never complain about Irish winter again, Anne. Never. Kaylee Doring is in the house. I was pleased to see you in my chat yesterday. I didn't get the chance to see the Aurora Borealis yesterday. Maybe tonight. Yeah, fingers crossed, Kaylee. Thank you, and great to see you. And thanks uh, for uh, tuning in. As they say, very interesting episode of a History with Kaylee yesterday in which she looked at um, how ancient monuments uh, survive earthquakes. Well, I think the question was, are they, uh, are they, uh, what was the question? Are they subject, to, are they likely to be damaged by earthquakes? Gobekli Tepe, I think, was one of the ones featured because it was not too far away from that recent awful earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Anne-Marie Fitzgerald says, beautiful weather, clear skies and sunshine in West Kerry. Uh, great stuff. Um, the sun is not shining now. 
like, I know Kerry is very a very special place, but there's no way the sun is shining now. You're talking about earlier. I'm only joking. Anne Marie, you're very welcome, and all of the people of Kerry are always very welcome on our live streams. Um, Tucson. Uh, that's Barbara Murphy. Cool and sunny for Barbara in Tucson, Arizona. You're very welcome, Barbara. Great to see you. It's a habit. We we saw we add sometimes Killaloo to the Ballina to distinguish ourselves from the Ballina that most people assume the one in County Mayo. Good point. But of course, with this learned gathering, there's no need. Good point, Alan. Yes, absolutely. John Main. Yeah. No more, no more freezing cold for you, John. Anna Pandas is in chilly Lancashire, where they're enjoying the Aurora. Is the Aurora on display at the moment in Lancashire? Brilliant stuff. Kathleen Gallagher is in the house. Hello, Kathleen. Good evening to you. Constance Kavanagh is in uh, Tuadadan and Baileyborough from Ballyfermot. Uh, you're in Baileyborough, but you're from Ballyfermot, uh, Constance. Brilliant stuff. I will get rid of the chewing gum in a moment. Erica Bow is in the house. Good afternoon, Erica. How are you keeping? Hope you're well. Hi, Anthony. Hi, all. That is Anya Ryan, who's watching us on the Mythical Ireland community. Rene Margot is in Yosemite, or near Yosemite uh, National F Forest. What's that? CA California. 320F. Is that? That's the temperature in Fahrenheit, is it? What's that in Celsius? Let me have a look. That's zero Celsius. That's cold. Yeah, that's cold enough. Rene, long time no see. Hope you're keeping well. Mavanway Millward has been a bit under the weather, so I won't stay long. Wanted to drop in and say hello. Look after yourself, Mavanway. That's the main thing. Uh, keep yourself uh, safe and well and uh, warm blankets and, I don't know, hot whiskey if that's your thing. I'm not sure. Or uh, honey, whatever, you know. But just make sure that you look after yourself. Who am I missing? Karen Jeffrey feels like a warm streak here in Massachusetts. Just reach a five-day high of 1.6 degrees. <laughs> Not quite summer yet there either by the sounds of it. Paul Greystone is in a comfy armchair in Lurkistan. <laughs> in the county of, yes, uh, Samantha Healy is in Warren Point. Samantha, a very good evening to you. You're welcome to Live Irish Myth. Porrick Byrne is saying hello from Oscar and Porrick in Mount Melick in County Leash. Porrick and Oscar, you're very welcome. A very good evening to you. Um, snowstorm, says Rene. Keep the snow. <clears throat> it can all, if you don't mind, hang on to it over there so we don't get any. Aurora watching, fingers crossed, says Samantha. Actually, just going to just check the figures. Looks like it's still quite positive um it's the cloud that's the big problem isn't it you know dennis dwyer says hello all hello dennis welcome to live irish myths uh, karen says that's 1.6 celsius yes uh, which is rather chilly and uh, uh a lot chillier than it is here in the moment Co keith says the sun is shining in australia i was under the impression that maybe that was a kind of a semi-permanent thing in australia sunshine you know but it probably doesn't shine all the time. We're probably mistaken about that. But it is warm, isn't it, even in the winter? Keith, a very good morning to you anyway. There's some evidence that the weather was a bit more clear at the time. And you have several days when the sun moves very little. Also, certain stars are all set in positions that can help on other days. Um, I presume you're talking about in prehistoric times. Um, yeah, the weather has got worse since then. Uh, Obera144 is joining from Kerry as well. Just after you mentioned Kerry, bad stuff. All the Kerry folk are joining us tonight. The kingdom, up the kingdom, the kingdom of Kerry, the kingdom of heaven, some would say. Pardon me. Michael Trott is saying a big hello. Wild weather, rain, flooding, plus pine forestry slash adding to the terrible disruption east coast of the North Island, New Zealand. Crikey, it's not a good crack after several weeks. Rain, best wishes. More captive with a cold today. Learn, learn it to uh, look after yourself, Michael. And yeah, uh, sounds as if uh, things are a little bit out of kilter there. And let's hope they get back in kilter rather soon. Pat uh, wants to ask a question. What is the best month to visit Ireland? <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for. And it depends if, like, do you want to avoid crowds? Do you want to avoid 
you know, uh, 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 high prices? Uh, that's a very, very difficult question to answer without kind of getting more detail. Um, Ireland, of course, is lovely to visit any time of the year, but you're less likely to get stormy weather uh, if you stick, you know, from, say, April through October. Um, we haven't had touch wood. We haven't had much in the way of winter storms this year, funnily enough. Um, poor old Michael Trott is bearing the brunt of that down in New Zealand. What they're getting is what we're not getting. Um, Ireland's nice to visit all year round, but the days are short in the winter, you know, and, and it's cold and it can be wet. It can be wet in the summer too, but at least it's a bit warmer, you know. Um, Amanda Morgan is joining us also from Australia in Queensland. Good morning, Amanda. Happy Tuesday to you. Hope you are in good form. That's three Australian viewers I've seen so far. Anthony Murphy, you skipped over my greeting, says Desiree O'Reilly. How dare I? I missed that. Lol, me and Amadeus made it home to a meter of snow, Colorado. Hope you had great fun in Louisiana. Wasn't it Louisiana you were in? And uh, I hope you enjoyed the Mardi Gras festivities. Uh, safely home. Glad to hear it. And uh, fully concentrated, I presume, for the uh, for the episode. Warm blankets are just the thing with hot lemon, honey, and ginger. No whiskey in the house, I'm afraid. Fair enough. Um, that sounds nice. That'll do the job. Get well soon. Anna Pandas uh, is, uh, yes, it's the second. Night of purple and green skies. Awesome. Wish I was in Dublin, though. We'll be heading across in May. Looking forward to it. I hope Anna and uh, Dublin will, I hope, give you a very uh, warm welcome. Charlene Henderson is saying snow with a snowflake beside it. There's a lot of that around, just thankfully not in Ireland. Um, it's all always so nice to join in here each week with familiar friends and new people as well, says Archaeostronomy Database, who's Ty or Tyrell. As somebody commented today on, on one of the YouTube, uh, the saved YouTube live streams, giving out about all the uh, chat at the beginning and that he had to leave after 12 minutes because he couldn't put up with it anymore. That's <laughs> like, tough. <laughs> Uh, Elaine says, I'm collecting great weather to bring along with me in 11 weeks. Sounds good, Anne, uh, Elaine. Uh, bring it on. Bring it with you. Absolutely. We'll open the doors for it. We'll give it a big Cade Neil of uh, Elizabeth Champagne is in Western Canada. Good afternoon to you, Elizabeth. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Samantha is watching for the Aurora. I'm keeping the fingers crossed. Indira Steph Stefaniana is in the house. We had a blizzard in the mountains and snow on the Hollywood sign. Wow. Still cold in that part of the world, you know. Will you send some over from Ireland, says Mavani. Are you talking about whiskey? We have a fine array, as you may know. Yes, uh, more than happy to do that. Um, who else? Did I miss anyone? It's quite cloudy out, apparently, still now. Uh, Paul Greystone tells us that Lurkistan is West Limerick. Thank you for clarifying that, Paul. You're very welcome regardless of where you're from. But Limerick is fine. Eva Barnett says, ha happy Monday, everybody. Same, many happy returns to you. Taziri says, it was a truly terrifying drive home with all the snow on the road. And I have a one hell of a shock going from 80 Fahrenheit to zero degrees and three feet of snow. Yeah, you probably should have stayed in Louisiana for a while. Um, yes, indeed. Um, seeing a lot of repeat comments, so I'm going to scroll down. Hopefully, I haven't missed anyone. If I have, please do a desire and let me know. <laughs> I don't want to be falling out with anybody for not saying hello. Donna Jean Porter lived in Colorado for 19 years. I remember the weather. Dennis Dwyer says the chatting is the best part. Well, it just makes everybody feel very welcome. What is better than a happy medium, says Charlene, or asks Charlene, a large medium. <laughs> Mark Gordon joins us from Iowa. Good afternoon, Mark. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you're keeping well. Now, I have a bit of a problem in that I was printing out the pages for tonight, and my printer, it hasn't packed in. I think it's just out of toner. But because, of course, I left it till the last minute, because I was trying to scoff my dinner, um... I haven't been able to print all the pages, so I may have to read some of this from the screen uh, in a little while. Anyway, tonight we are returning to the subject 
that we were on uh, discussing last week in last week's episode, which is the Handbook of Irish Antiquities that was published uh, by uh, William F. Wakeman in 1848. And we had uh, uh, two, I hope you found them interesting. Certainly the reaction last week when I suggested we do another was very positive. I hope you enjoyed the first two episodes tonight. We are moving forward a little bit into the Christian era. And uh, we're going to discuss or read, pardon me, get rid of the chewing gum, what Wakeman had to say in relation to some of the early Christian uh, ruins, monasteries, monuments, crosses, etc., churches of Ireland. What do you call a petite psychic that's escaped from prison, asks Caitlin Moon. A small medium at large. <laughs> Helena Breen is saying fortune to all the Tua and to myself. Helena, thank you and many happy returns. You're very welcome to the stream, of course. Uh, Paul Greystone tells us, when I lived and worked on Orkney Islands, Midsummer solstice midnight, it never went dark. Yeah, same here in the Boyne Valley. It's just more pronounced as you go north. Mad stuff, you know. Uh, Amadeus was mad at you. He wanted his hello. Hello, Amadeus. <laughs> uh, no doubt Coda will make himself uh, heard uh, rather soon. Um, I, I imagine before too long. Speaking of dogs. I named my two dogs Rolex and Timex. They're my watchdogs. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> Inish Murray. I am kindly permitted by Richard Jones Esquire of Streda House Grange near Sligo to state for the information of intending pilgrims to Inish Murray that upon receiving some day's notice of their intention to visit the place, he could arrange with certain native fishermen to have a proper craft in waiting at Streda Point. Back, folks, be long before the days of uh, tourist offices and uh, uh, tourist facilities uh, where you could, you know, uh, get a boat. Uh, you had to rely on the local fishermen. Uh, mad stuff, I know. Uh, but this is the mid 19th century and uh, we'd have to wait a while before all of that what we call the tourist infrastructure came about the cost of the trip to and fro would be from one pound to 30 shillings according to the number to be conveyed or the state of the weather <laughs> more expensive in choppy weather obviously the distance from the point is about four miles or so and the sail or row on a fine day may be accomplished in little over an hour. Colonel Wood Martin uh, states, and a special hello to uh, Davik, who's David, uh, who apparently tries to comment on YouTube and uh, his uh, comments don't appear, which is yeah, strange. Don't know why that is. Um, but a very good evening to you. He's just sending me a message there. Uh, Carlos says, hi. Giagwich Carlos, welcome to the live stream. Um, Anna Panda says, Elbokov, Elbokov, Elbokov. <laughs> Astro is running late, but got here. Yeah, just in the nick of time. We've literally only started reading now. Um, could you give William Wakeman's time period? Thanks. We did but i will repeat it no i'm of course perfectly happy to repeat it but william wakeman's uh the book we're reading he he, he was born in 1822 and died in 1900 and the book that we're reading from from was published in 1848 hope that helps rex um yes uh carl deegan is in the house uh august banjia which uh carl Thanks for joining us. Colonel Wood Martin states that uh, he was another antiquarian who wrote, and we've read from his work, but we'll probably read more, I think, in time. Colonel Wood Martin states that, quote, tourists can be conveyed in a good five ton boat from Ross's Point near Sligo for 30 shillings, and that, if the wind be favourable, that is the pleasanter as well as the shorter route, unquote. The Martyrology of Donegal presents the following notice of this 
acts of the founder of this establishment. August 12th, M Molashe, i.e. Lashrain, son of Delgan, sorry, son of Deglam, of Inish Muradach in the north, i.e. the north of Connacht, he it was who was at the cross of A Imlaishi, pronounced sentence of banishment on St. Columba. Uh, Ad, is it Adian? Uh, it's not Aidan. Is it Adian? Guess says hello all. Gia, Gwich, welcome to the live stream. Thanks uh, for joining us, and uh, hope you enjoy yourself here among this nice community. I need hardly state that these saints flourished in the sixth century, and that the latter named was no other than the great apostle of the Picts, whose principal foundation in Scotland was Iona. The following list of the antiquities remaining upon Inish Murray I reproduce from my notice of that island published in the Journal of the Royal Historical and Archaeological Association of Ireland for October 1885, number 64. Anybody here been to Inish Murray? I wonder. You're very welcome, Carl. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, and so here is the list. Uh, one, the Cashel or Stone Fort, fort with its kele. It looks like C E L L A E, a diphthong. Diphthongs, dip, diphthongs where two letters are joined, isn't it? Two, Chuck Molesha or Molays. I always read it as Molays, and perhaps some of the locals can tell me exactly how the saint's name is pronounced. The oratory or dwelling of Saint Molay's. Three, Champel Navarre, or the Church of the Men. This was, no doubt, the Champel Moor, the great church of the establishment. It is sometimes styled the Monastery and is also known as Champel Molay's. Uh, in, we're in uh, Sligo, uh, Inish Murray. There's Anne Marie Fitzgerald talking about uh, to that. I think that person who was saying, When is a good time to visit Ireland? Off peak is quieter and cheaper. There you go. Uh, Champel Natenye, or the Church of the Fire. This structure is evidently less ancient than the other ecclesiastical buildings remaining upon the island. Champel Naman, the Church of the Women. A number of altars within and without the cashel, most of them bearing very ancient and curiously carved crosses of stone, swearing stones, etc., etc. Seven, two monuments of a class usually styled whole stones, which are held in high veneration on account of certain supernatural powers which they are supposed to possess. Eight, Eight memorial lacs, L-E-A-C-S, bearing inscriptions in Irish or Latin. Of course, a lac in, 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 in one of its meanings is like a gravestone or a memorial stone. Nine, monumental stones, unlettered, but bearing inscribed crosses of extremely er early form. Ten, several bullons or font-like objects of stone, the precise use of which has not yet been ascertained. 11. Sacred wells with their coverings of stone. 12. Yachta or stations. And 13. Chach am Alish or the sweat house. Think of that as like a, an early medieval uh, sauna for the, uh, the, uh, the religious folk or the, the monks, maybe. Were there nuns too? Chapel Naman. There's a church of the women as well. SPCM says, Sorry, I'm late. Hello from Knocknashee in South Sligo and magnificent Neolithic Cairns and Bronze Age forts. Inish Murray is a beautiful place. I really recommend it. Brilliant stuff. And yes, Knocknashee, what a fabulous part of the world. I wonder if you clear skies, are you seeing any aurora? The above catalogue comprises every class of remain to be found on this singularly interesting island. Right. As a museum of antiquities relating chiefly to the earlier period of the ancient Irish church. To the wells and some of the monuments 
I shall have to refer further on. And now we're moving to Devonish Island. Archaeological students or tourists in quest of the picturesque who may visit the north of Ireland and chance to be in the neighbourhood of Enniskillen should by all means see the famous island of Devonish lying in Loch Erne at a distance of about two miles from the town. Rowboats and men to pull them, sorry, rowboats and men to pull them can be easily engaged at a very moderate cost if a bargain be made before starting. In other words, if you're getting a boat out to the island, don't uh, expect to be bargaining on your way out. Make sure you strike a price before you go. Ah, uh, Desiree, very well heard. I mean, you're very, uh, uh, what's the word? You're, you're very, um, I can't think. I can't think of words tonight. You are very uh, perceptive, is the word I was going to say. Yes, 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 yes. That was indeed Saskia going outside. Brilliant stuff. Um, home sweet home, says Sue. Have visited it often. Brilliant stuff. Um, yes, clear skies last night. We can see the Northern Lights clearly, says SPCM. Yeah, anybody got clear skies at Aurora tonight in Ireland or in, in Britain, please do let us know. Um I, I may dip out. I may nip out afterwards uh, if there's clear skies. If not, I probably won't. No point going out into the countryside to spend the night looking at clouds, is there? So it depends on what you're into. The patron of this island bore the name uh, Molaise or Molasha. I presume in Irish it's pronounced Molasha, but I'm going to say Molaise just to keep it handy. Dr. Reeves, Bishop of Down, Connor and Dromore, has taken care to point out that St. Molay's or Lashrain of Inishmurray is not to be confounded with St. Molashi uh, de Avinci or Devonish, son of Nadfreach, whose day is the 12th of September. Here we find the walls of the oratory of the saint. They are truly Cyclopean in style. Not far distance, distant stands the model round tower in Ireland, the model round tower of Ireland in a state of perfect preservation. In one respect, its cornice is unique in as much as it displays an array of rich mouldings in the Hiberno-Romanesque character and four human heads supposed to represent Saints Patrick, Bridget, Columba and Molaise, respectively. Fascinating stuff. And then we're moving on to the chapter about churches. Hope everybody is still comfortable. I'm going to quickly let Saskia back in and I'm just going to check the sky. Bear with me one moment while I do that. Ah, uh, yes. Dog in. Oh, sorry. Better not trip over that. Dog in. Sky cloudy. Now she let out a, a, a husky yelp. I know those well. Yeah, yeah. She's. She. she yeah, Sasuke is funny. You know, she. She's quiet most of the time, but she can be very vocal, you know. Anthony, was the word lack as in leeches, D or S, doctors by profession? Lack was L E A C, I think, uh, which is the Irish word. L E A C S, memorial lacks. L E A C, uh, pronounced lack. Amadeus is the same, says Desiree. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Coda, on the other hand, is just vocal a lot of the time, you know. Most of the subjects which I now select for illustration lie within easy access from Dublin. They may, as a rule, be considered of strictly typical character. Incredible as it may appear to those who have paid but slight attention to the subject of the ancient ecclesiastical antiquities of Ireland, it is nevertheless a fact that there exist in this country some hundreds of churches which, in point of an antiquity at least, 
may be classed amongst the most remarkable structures of Christian times now to be found in Europe. The remains of which we shall speak carry with them incontestable evidence of their remote era. Their architectural features and details are of such a character that the surprise is not so great on account of their antiquity in Christian chapels, which is an old Irish word for church, as at their appearance in structures of an era so comparatively late as they are often truly Etruscan. Of their usual characteristics, we shall here give a brief description, referring the reader who may desire more than a general sketch to Dr. Petrie's beautiful work already mentioned in which, in which the subject uh, has been fully discussed. And of course, I mentioned uh, Dr. George Petrie, who is the father of archaeology, whose work Wakeman did uh, was commissioned to do drawings for, or Wakeman uh, published uh, his own uh, uh, handbook. Doorways, covered by a horizontal lintel or headed with a semicircular arch, springing from plain square edged imposts. Occasionally, the arch is cut out of a single stone. Wow. At Glendalough are examples in which the lintel is surmounted by a semicircular arch, the space between being filled up with masonry. The stones generally extend the whole thickness of the wall. Few of the very early doorways exhibit any kind of decoration beyond a plain projecting band, of which there are some fine examples at Glendalough. Is Brendan Burnin there? No, Brendan's away, I think. He said hello from somewhere else recently. Um... So uh, he's not maybe tuned in to this. So he may be interested afterwards because he lives down that direction. The door appears to have been placed against the interior face of the wall. It, as in many instances. The, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I, I was out late last night photographing Aurora. And I came home to process the pictures and didn't share a photo. Oh, I didn't get to bed till about half one or two o'clock this morning. I do apologize. I will make up for it by getting extra sleep tonight or doing my best to do same. Uh, the door appears to have been placed against the interior face of the wall. As in many instances, the stones for a distance of about three inches from the angle have been slightly hollowed, evidently for the reception of a frame. Two, windows, invariably small and with one or two exceptions splaying internally, headed generally with small semicircular arches, either formed of several small stones or cut out of a single large one. But the horizontal lintel is common, as is also a triangular head. The sizes of the windows, like the doorway jams, almost invariably incline, sorry, the sides of the windows, almost invariably incline. They are rarely decorated and then in the simplest manner, by a projecting band similar to that occasionally found upon the early doorways or by a small bead. Three, choir arch. In the very ancient churches to which chancels are attached, the connecting arch is invariably semicircular, square edged and plain. It is usually formed of stones pretty equal in size, well hammered and admirably fitted to each other. The greater number of primitive Irish churches, however, have no chancel, their plan being a simple oblong. Belfries, four belfries, the Clugchach or round tower, Clugchach literally means a bell tower or bell house, appears to have been the most usual belfry. The ancient structure at Glendalough, call, called St. Kevin's Kitchen, supports upon its western gable a small tower which appears to have answered this purpose and the sketch of uh, St. Kevin's Kitchen was the one that was featured on the graphic for today's episode if, you, if you've seen that and uh, we can share that uh, later. Bell turrets, properly speaking, were not common before the 13th century. Interesting. Five, masonry. Generally of very large stones, well fitted together, as in Cyclopean work. In some of the oldest examples, no mortar appears to have been used, but these instances are very rare, 
and mortar is generally found cementing enormous stones, but never in large quantities. Six, roofs. The roofs of most of the ancient Irish churches have long disappeared, but several of stone still remain. Their pitch is exceedingly high, and they are sometimes constructed upon arches. I assume or presume uh, that at an early stage, uh, the builders of these uh, church roofs realized that if it, the pitch isn't quite steep, uh, that the rain and the wind will find a way in under the uh, uh, under the timbers or under the slates or whatever. Examples of this kind occur in St. Columns House at Kells, in Cormac's Chapel at Cashel, in St. Kevin's Kitchen at Glendalough, and in a few other structures. Such are the more usual and prominent characteristics of the early Irish churches. It should be observed that the doorway, with few exceptions, is almost always found to occupy a position in the centre of the west end. The windows in chancelled churches are generally five in number, one in the eastern gable and one in each of the side walls of the nave and choir. I shall now direct my reader's attention to the ro most remarkable example in the, in the immediate vicinity of Dublin, viz. the church in Kilini. And remembering that this was published in the famine era, he has a footnote that says the churchyard gate is usually locked, but the key can be procured from a caretaker who resides in the neighbouring village. Of course, Kalini, uh, now a suburb of Dublin City and not such a, 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 a small countryside village anymore. This ruin is situated near the village of the same name, at a distance of about nine miles from the metropolis, and less than a half a mile from Kilini Station on the Dublin, Wicklow and Wexford Railway. And that's still there today, folks. And will be found particularly interesting to the student of Irish church architecture. Its extreme dimensions upon the interior are 35 feet. The nave measures but 12 feet and 8 inches. And the chancel 9 feet and 6 inches in breadth. The church originally consisted of a simple nave and choir lighted in the usual manner and connected by a semicircular arch. But at a period long subsequent to its original foundation, an addition, the architecture of which it will be well to compare with that of the more ancient building, has been made uh, on the northern side. The original doorway, which as usual is placed in the centre of the west gable, is remarkable for having a cross sculptured on the under part of its lintel. It measures in height six feet and one inch, in breadth at the top two feet and at the bottom two feet four inches. This, which may be looked upon as a most characteristic example of its class, measures in breadth where the arch is, sorry, where the arch begins to spring four feet seven inches and at the base four feet ten and a half inches. Its height is only six and a half feet. The chancel windows display the inclined sides, so indicative of antiquity when found in Irish ecclesiastical remains, but with the exception of that facing the east, they are in a state of great dilapidation. The eastern window is square-headed, both within and without, and exhibits the usual splay. The comparatively modern addition to the northern side of the nave, which appears to have been erect erected as a kind of aisle, is connected with the original church by several openings broke through the north side wall. It may be well to compare its architectural features with those of the older structure. The pointed doorway offers a striking contrast to that of the west gable and its eastern window is equally different from that in the ancient chancel, being larger and chamfered upon the exterior. The fact of a semicircular arch head being cut out of a single stone is of itself no proof of high antiquity, as it occurs in many comparatively late structures in Ireland, and in England I recollect to have seen in the perpendicular church of Kirkthorpe near Wakefield, a door head that exhibited this mode of construction. 
the church, the church, the church, <laughs> pardon my <laughs> mispronunciation, uh, the church of Kilternan, situated near the little village of Golden Ball, about six miles from Dublin on the Enniskerry Road, presents several features of considerable interest. The south side wall and the west gable are original and of great antiquity. The latter contains a square headed doorway now stopped up with masonry and to supply its place a pointed entrance has been inserted in the south side wall. This alteration was made probably at the time of the re-erection of the eastern end, the style of which indicates a period not earlier than the close of the 13th century, about which time the custom of placing the doorway in the west end appears to have ceased. There are several older churches in the immediate vicinity, sorry, in the immediate neighbourhood. I have no idea why I'm putting the word vicinity in there. In the immediate neighbourhood of Dublin, which contain features of very high antiquity, and they have been altered and remodelled at various times and are upon the whole characteristic of later periods. Some of these we shall notice when describing the early pointed style as found in Irish remains, confining our remarks for the present to such examples of the primitive ecclesiastical architecture of Ireland as are easy of access from Dublin. Howard Aikens is looking forward to landing in Ireland on Wednesday. Perhaps we will get a view of the Aurora Borealis. Cold rain here. We will be ready for the Irish weather. Well, hopefully it'll treat you well, Howard. I'm looking forward to seeing you while you're here. Any pagan elements such as the sitting Christ or Kernunos like figure, as in some barrels found in the Vikes, the High Cross, and excuse the spelling. Not quite sure um, about that, Michael. Uh, Kernunos, no. Uh, but I know that sometimes the Sheila and the Gig is confused. Uh, with a Kernunus, uh, we have Sheila the gigs in several churches, or at least we did. Uh, there, they were or are commonplace in churches from the Norman era forward. Pat is hoping to visit Glendalough on our way now to a small Benedictine priory here in Vermont. Nice. Um, Adina Sparks loved our visit there. Rainy days, so not many others made it special. And we are now moving on to uh, Glendalough. Uh, Wakeman has something to say about Glendalough, which is absolutely fine. Is everybody comfortable? Is everybody warm and comfortable and relaxed? Glendalough, County Wicklow, the lone and singularly picturesque valley of Glendalough in the county of Wicklow, lying at a distance of about 24 miles from the metropolis, presents a scene which, for stern and desolate grandeur, is in many respects unsurpassed. And indeed, it is a beautiful, beautiful setting. Lovely part of the world. Huge, gloomy mountains upon which clouds almost continually rest, encompass and in some places overhang the silent and almost uninhabited glen. And there's a footnote here. Since the above was written, Glendalough has greatly changed. A considerable number of houses have been built in and about the village, and there is an excellent hotel. The beginnings of tourism infrastructure, folks, in the mid-19th century. Visitors from Dublin can easily arrive at the ancient city by rail and a short drive by car or van. There you go. Railway uh, in 1848 mustn't have been very uh, old, must have only been there a few years. See Guide to Wicklow, published by Hodges, Figgis and Company. Fascinating. Two little, two little lakes now appearing in the deepest shadow, uh, now of reflecting the blue vault, according as the clouds above them come and go, a winding stream and grey rocks jutting here and there out from heath, from out the heath, form its natural features. A noble monastic establishment round which a city subsequently rose, flourished and decayed, was founded here in the early part of the 6th century by St. Kevin. The ruins of many ecclesiastical structures yet remain, and, quote, the long continuous shadow of the lofty and slender round tower moves slowly from morn till eve over wasted churches, crumbling oratories, 
excuse me, shattered crosses, scathed yew, yew trees, and tombs now undistinguish, undistinguishable of bishops, abbots, and anchorites, unquote. Here, few of the gay tourists by whom the Glen is yearly visited view these ruins with any other feeling than that of idle and ignorant curiosity. Hmm, it's a bit judgmental, isn't it? Their ears have been poisoned with the burlesque and lying tales, bracket, inventions of the last century, close bracket, which the wretched men and women miscalled guides of the place have composed for the entertainment of the thoughtless. They wander unmoved among the shrines, which nearly 13 centuries ago were raised in honor of their God by men joyous and thankful in the feeling of certain immortality. Men whose fathers in their youth had rever reverenced the Druid as a more than human counselor. That several of the existing churches formed part of the original foundation, their style of architecture sufficiently indicates. The noble doorway of the Ladies' Church, a modern name, is perhaps the grandest of the kind remaining and exhibits in a striking degree that early Greek form, which is so very commonly found in the doorways and in other openings of our most ancient churches and round towers, even though, sorry, and even though more rudely developed in the Cahirs and other Irish remains of the pagan era, with a capital P, if you don't mind, folks. There you go. Ah, uh, there's just nothing like a, a dog and cuddling, you know. Ah, is there a tower or something in Glasnevin Cemetery that was based off of that type of architecture? That's the tower that was erected over the tomb of Daniel O'Connell, isn't it? Isn't it the O'Connell round tower? I'm not misthinking, am I? It's Daniel O'Connell rather than. Yes, it is. It's Daniel O'Connell. Yeah, his, uh, that's basically uh, a very fancy memorial uh, to O'Connell. Is a full-sized round tower in Glasnevin. The remarkable building called St. Kevin's Kitchen, now, alas, sadly mutilated, is not the least interesting object in the group. Its high-pitched roof of stone remains in a perfect state, as I'm glad to report it still does to this day, uh, my dear people. A doorway in the western gable displays an instance of the lintel surmounted by an arch. The chancel, which a few years ago remained, though of great antiquity and stone roofed, appears to have been an addition, and a portion of the ancient east window may still be observed in the wall, just above the head of the choir arch, which was not formed in the usual manner, but cut out of the masonry. The little tower upon the west end appears to be the earliest example of a belfry springing from a roof or gable. But this, as well as the sacristy, is of later date than the rest of the building. Trinity Church, perhaps in a greater degree than any coeval structure in Leinster, retains the original character of its various parts. It possesses a magnificent specimen of the square-headed doorway, a choir arch, of its class certainly the finest in Ireland. Chancel windows with heads semicircular or triangular. In fact, almost every characteristic of the more ancient style of church architecture in Ireland, and each perfect in its own way. There was formerly a round tower belfry attached to the western end. Fascinating stuff. In that singularly interesting ruin, styled the monastery, are columns which, upon their capitals, exhibit ornamental sculpture of a style peculiar to monuments of the 9th and 10th centuries. These in England would usually be pronounced Norman, more particularly as the arch which they were designed to sustain displays a variety 
of the zigzag or chevron molding as may be seen from several of its stones which yet remain this arch has in a great measure been recently restored uh, the Raffiart or royal cemetery church though less imposing in its general appearance than several of the equally ancient remains in the more eastern part of the glen is on account of its association with the life of the founder not surpa surpassed in interest by any of the others in the cemetery of this raffiart church was preserved about half a century since an ancient inscribed tombstone popularly called king o'toole's monument but it has long disappeared quote the guides unquote having sold it in small pieces to tourists scarcely less ignorant than themselves the large structure alva says i've heard that the conical caps on the old round towers were added when christianity arrived here the, the the round towers are christian structures the round towers were built uh by uh christian monks and are almost exclusively found in conjunction with uh, uh monastic or christian settlements august can be too hot believe it or believe it or not says kelly nikiali are you talking about in ireland no it's never too hot in ireland the temperature's never been above what is it 31 32 degrees celsius no you, uh, kelly you must be talking about some other part of the world the large structure standing within the enclosure of the cemetery a little eastward from the round tower is popularly styled the cathedral and appears from its name dimensions and position to have been anciently the dalmach moor or dowliag moor or chief church of the place notwithstanding its present state uh, and of course Dowlig uh, meaning a, a church um, or an old church uh, giving its name to the village of Dulik in County Mead um, from the Dowlig there which is said to be the oldest stone church in Ireland the oldest surviving the walls of it are still surviving notwithstanding its present state of dilapidation there are in Ireland few structures of the same antiquity and extent that retain so many original features. The tower adjoining is one of the largest and most perfectly preserved now remaining. Its semicircular doorway head, carved out of a single stone, may be looked upon as a good example of that peculiar mode of construction. A cashel or wall appears usually to have enclosed the greater number of the ancient Irish monastic establishments. That such a work uh, anciently existed at Glendalough is certain, though scarcely a vestige of it at present remains above ground. One of the gateways, however, until very lately, stood in a near, nearly perfect state. It is described and engraved by Dr. Petrie on the Round Towers, page 447, and his prophecy that for want of care, this monument, unique in its kind, would soon cease to exist, became half fulfilled shortly after upon the fall of the principal arch. The stones, however, have been reset and the work possesses much of its pristine appearance. I have but slightly glanced at the greater and more generally interesting ruins of this celebrated glen. It also contains numerous relics such as crosses, monumental stones, etc., which by a visitor should not be overlooked. But as I shall have occasion to refer, uh, but as I shall have occasion to refer my readers to other and much finer remains of each class of antiquities which they represent, it would be at least unnecessary to describe them here. I may, however, mention the singular chamber called Saint Kevin's Bed. That it is altogether a work of art cannot be satisfactorily demonstrated. 
And this is where I have to refer now, uh, unfortunately, to the digital version, uh, my good uh, listeners, because my printer ran out of um, toner at this point. And even though I took out the toner cartridge and shook it around, hoping that I might get a few more pages out of it, uh, I, 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 uh, I was unable to get it to... Uh, to move any further so the rest i'm going to be reading from the screen for which i apologize uh we haven't got too too long to go but we'll carry on nonetheless though to a certain degree its artificial character is distinctly marked it is quite possible that a natural cavity the sides of which have been roughly hewn and squared may have existed previously the bed which is situated in an almost overhanging rock at a considerable distance above the lake, is said to have been the residence of St. Kevin at some period, when pursuing that course of study and contemplation for which his name, even to this day, is revered. And the celebrated St. Lawrence O'Toole is said to have spent much of his time in prayer and heavenly contemplation in this cavern. Uh, quite a location for a, a, what is it called, an anchorite or a... a uh, some sort of a hermit trying to re retreat from the world, you know, you know. Uh, and then we refer to St. Colum's house in Kells. Uh, this is Kells in the county of Mead. That, um, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll probably read this momentarily, that is, the, is that the scriptorium uh, of Kells? Because that's reopened to the public now. Anyway, I will read on just in case that I am preempting something that I'm about to encounter in Wakeman's work. One of the earliest examples of cylindrical vaulting remaining in Ireland occurs in the structure called St. Columns House, C-O-L-U-M-B apostrophe S, St. Columns House at Kells, County of Meath. The arch, which is completely devoid of ornament, springs from the side walls. and separates the body of the building from a small croft to which access was anciently gained by a quadrangular opening about 19 inches in breadth adjoining the west gable. Two walls crossing and resting upon this arch and pierced each with a small semicircular headed doorway together with the gables support a roof of stone. The lower apartment was lighted by two windows one in the centre of the east end, the other in the south side wall. Both windows are small and splay inwardly. That to the east is formed with a semicircular arch, while the other presents a triangular head. The ancient doorway, which was elevated in the west end, has been almost obliterated. St. Columns House is supposed to have combined the purpose of it, of sorry the purpose of an oratory with that of a habitation and in this respect to class with St Kevin's house or kitchen at Glendalough St Flan's house at Killaloo and one or two other structures Coda says hello Desiree and uh It's Amadeus, isn't it? Talk about having a brain fart. God. Um, yes. How did they know True North? Asks Marcus. Um, True North, yeah. I'll let someone else answer that. I was going to say use the pole star. I don't know what the pole star was in the 6th century. Adriano Begelin, sneaking in late tonight. Good evening and welcome. Hope you're well, Ad Adrian, and better late than ever. Me and Amadeus were wondering if he was going to say hi today. No worries, actually, we all have those days. Yeah, <laughs> just 
I'm blaming, you know, the, the a semi hibernation state that I've been in over the winter. Bring on those long spring days and, and long evenings when the sun doesn't settle seven and eight o'clock in the evening. Um, and I can get out and about. I'm looking forward to it. So an oratory and a habitation. Whether we regard it as a habitation or as a church, to which purpose this, in common with similar buildings, was certainly through many ages applied, it is a ruin of no common interest. And I strongly recommend such of my readers as may have a day or two to spare to visit Kells. That's Kells in the county of Meath, not the other Kells. The round tower adjoining and the various crosses in the cemetery and in the marketplace afford severally an admirable study, uh, as they absolutely do. The one in the marketplace uh, moved outside the tourist office and placed under a protective covering. The latter are only inferior in size to the beautiful remains at Monaster Boyce, of which notice will be found in a subsequent chapter. No good pole star at the time, but there are various methods to find north. Shortest shadow of a stick marked out over a day, halfway between rise set point of any star on a mostly even horizon. How can you tell that it is the north star and not just any other star? Well, uh, how you can tell Polaris as the north star is the fact that it doesn't move. Everything moves around the pole star. You watch the pole star um for the ho whole night it stays in the same place everything else revolves around it and we will do a little bit about early decorated churches uh, until i start to see students falling asleep at the back of the class and you'll be given extra homework you lot there'll be an exam at the end caitlin moon says an ancient method of finding and extending direction by martin is it Isler or Eiler is a great article. There you go. Somebody is saying greetings on the Mythical Ireland community. I will find out who that is. One moment. Because I closed down the Mythical Ireland community tab, so I'm going to have to open it up again. That is Michael Pike. Hello, Michael. Fault you. Uh, welcome to uh, Live Irish Myths. Churches like those to which reference has just been made are, are such as we have every reason to believe were generally constructed. Sorry, I read that wrong, didn't I? Churches like those to which reference has just been made are such as we have every reason to believe were generally constructed during the earlier ages of Christianity in this kingdom. What a convoluted sentence. Anyway, how long the style continued is a matter of very great uncertainty. The horizontal lintel appears gradually to have given place to the semicircular arch head. The high pitched roof becomes flattened, the walls lose much of their cyclopean character, and in several examples, a considerable quantity of cement appears to have been used. The windows exhibit a slight recess or a chamfer upon the exterior and are of greater size. A small bead moulding is occasionally found extending round an arch upon the interior. The walls are generally higher and of somewhat inferior masonry. As the style advanced, the sides of the doorways became cut into a series, a series of recesses, the angles of which were slightly rounded off. The addition of a, hang on, let's skip over to the next page, slight moulding. At first, a mere incision upon the piers would seem to have suggested pillars. Chevron and other decorations, which in England are supposed to indicate the Norman period, are commonly found, but they are generally simple lines cut upon the face and soffit of the arch. Pediments now appear, and the various mouldings and other details of doorways and other openings become rich and striking, and in some respects bear considerable analogy to true Norman work. The capitals frequently represent human heads, the hair of which is interlaced with snake-like animals. A similar style of decoration is displayed upon the features of several of the round towers as at Timahoe. The church of Kilashin in the Queen's County, uh, lying at a distance of about, I bet you I pronounced that wrong, Kilashin, Kilashin. 
Kilashin. Kilashin. Kilashin, I'd say. Lying at a distance of about two miles, moving swiftly on, about two miles from Carlow, appears to have been one of the most beautiful structures of this class ever erected in Ireland. Its doorway, until very lately, retained in a remarkable degree the original sharpness of its sculpture. I was informed that many years ago, a resident in the neighborhood used to take a resident in the neighborhood used to take pleasure in destroying as far as lay in his power the interesting capitals here represented, and that to his labors and not to the effects of time, we may attribute the almost total obliteration of an Irish inscription which formerly extended around the abacus and of which but few letters at present remain. It appears that within the last half century, there has been a greater destruction of Irish antiquities through sheer wantonness than the storms and frost and, sorry, just again, finding the right, and lightning of ages could have accomplished. Something never changed, do they? Vandals still at work these days. Such acts of vandalism have not always been perpetrated by the unlettered peasant. Indeed, the devotional feeling of the labouring classes to the greater part of Ireland leads them to regard antiquities, especially those of ecclesiastical origin, with a feeling of veneration. These outrages have most frequently been committed by our conservers, by contractors for the erection of new buildings for the sake of the stones, or, for the same reason, by men of station and education who should have recollected that age and neglect cannot deprive structures once consecrated to God and applied to the service of religion to any portion of their sacred character. The Church of Kilashin is perhaps late in the style. The arches, there are four concentric, which form the doorway, display a great variety of ornamental detail, consisting of chevron work, animals, etc., etc., a pediment surmounts the external arch and a window to the south side wall is canopied by a broad band ascending and converging in straight lines. A window of similar construction appears in the round tower of Timaho. Perhaps one of the most remarkable specimens of this style of church remaining occurs at Rahan near Tullamore in the King's County. It is minutely described and illustrated by Dr. Petrie in page 240 and 241 of the work to which I've so frequently alluded. It appears from historical evidence to belong to the 8th century. A triple choir arch and a circular window, highly ornamental, are the chief remaining details of the original building. The piers of the former are rounded off into semi-columns with capitals of very singular character totally distinct from Norman work. The bases are globular in form and are sculptured in each compartment out of a single stone. The capitals or imposts are ornamented upon their angles with human heads, the hair of which is carried back and represented by shallow lines cut upon the face of the stone in a very fanciful manner. The window, which is seven feet, six inches in diameter, is composed of stones unequal in size and displaying chevron ornaments in very low relief. It is a fact well worthy of observation that the details which I have mentioned as characteristic of this style, pardon me, oh crikey, are never found associated with others known to belong exclusively to the Norman period. Now there follows a section on the Rock of Cashel uh, for what I believe might be three or four pages. I wonder, have we got time for that? Asha, will we read on? Yeah, uh, Erica, if you take the two easternmost or right-hand parts of the plough, the two stars, and follow them up, you get to the pole star. Yeah, that is true. I'm being... In... Oh, I do apologize. I'm really sorry. Kathy Mayday always here. My lunch wasn't until 1pm today. At least I got to get into the end. Hope all are well. Uh, very nice to see you, Kathy May. I hope you enjoy your lunch. Sorry that you're late, but you have lots to uh, look back on 
uh, when you get the chance. Okay, we'll do Rocket Cash. Lots of people saying, yes, let's read on. So let's read on. The Great Southern and Western Railway brings Cashel within a few hours' journey of the metropolis. And, of course, that is still there today, the railway that connects Dublin and Cork. And as the ruins upon the celebrated rock are unparalleled, at least in Ireland. Am I right about that now? She's, do you know what? I'm not entirely sure that I am. I think I am. I think the main, main Dublin to Cork railway line passes Cashel or uh, somewhere in that vicinity. Hope I haven't spoken out of turn now. Um, Temple Moor. I'm looking on Google Earth as I speak here because I'm suddenly doubting myself in a very major way. Can't immediately find it. Somebody will know. Somebody else who's watching um, answer that question. Um, is Cashel on or close to the main Dublin Belfast railway line or was it on the end of a branch line off that? I'm probably wrong. It's probably it was probably a branch line. Yes, the ruins upon the celebrated rock, uh, says Wakeman, are unparalleled, at least in Ireland, for picturesque beauty and antiquarian interest. There are few by whom there are few by whom a visit to the place would not be remembered with pleasure. Cormac's Chapel, which, with the exception of the Round Tower, is the most ancient structure of the group, was built by Cormac McCarthy, King of Munster, in the beginning of the 12th century, not to be confused with uh, Cormac MacCullionon, uh, the King Bishop, uh, the 9th century King Bishop of Cashel, in the beginning of the 12th century. It is roofed with stone, and its capitals, arches, and other features and details uh, sorry, and in its capitals, arches, and other features and details, the Hiberno Romanesque style is distinctly marked. The plan is a nave and chancel with a square tower on either side at their junction. The southern tower ornamented externally is ornamented externally with six projecting bands, three of which are continued along the side walls of the structure, and it is finished at the top by a plain parapet the masonry of which is different from that of the other portions and evidently of a later period. The northern tower remains in its original state and is covered with a pyramidical cap of stone. Limerick Junction and Thurlis. No, not on the Cork line. Okay. That's uh, Anya Ryan uh, was one of the answer answerers there. And... Um, B, yeah. An almost endless variety of Hiberno-Romanesque decorations appear upon the arches and other features of the building, both within and without. Both nave and chancel are roofed with a semicircular arch resting upon square ribs, not to be com confused with spare ribs, which spring from a series of massive semi-columns set at equal distances against the walls. The bases of these semi-columns are on a level with the capitals of the choir arch, the abacus of which is continued as a string course around the interior of the building. The walls of both nave and chancel beneath the string course are ornamented with a row of semicircular arches slightly recessed and enriched with chevron, billet and other ornamental and mouldings. Sorry, ornaments and mouldings. Those of the nave spring from square imposts resting upon piers, while those in the chancel have pillars and well-formed capitals. There are small crofts to which access is gained by a spiral stair in the southern tower between the arches over both nave and chancel and the external roof. These little apartments were probably used as dormitories by the ecclesiastics. A somewhat similar croft in the church of St. Dulux near Dublin is furnished with a fireplace, a fact which clearly demonstrates that they were applied 
to the purpose of a habitation. Sounds cozy, doesn't it? The doorways of Cormac's Chapel are three in number, one in the centre of the west end and one in each of the side walls of the nave within a few feet of the west gable. The northern and southern doorways are original and are headed with a tympanum or lintel between the aperture and the semicircular arches above. They are both exceedingly rich in sculpture, but they are both exceedingly rich in sculpture, but the northern doorway appears to have been the chief entrance, as it is considerably larger and more highly decorated than the other. It is surmounted with a canopy, and the tympanum is sculptured with a very singular device, representing a combat between a centaur armed with bow and arrow and a huge animal probably intended for a lion. The head of the centaur is covered by a conical helmet with a nasal and he is shooting a barbed arrow into the breast of the lion. A small animal beneath the feet of the latter appears to have been slain in the encounter. The western doorway is not canopied and its tympanum is sculptured with a single animal, not unlike the lion upon the other. As recorded in our annals, Cormac's chapel was consecrated in AD 1134 with great ceremony. There can therefore be no question as to, to the age of this beautiful structure, which is said on competent authority to be equal to anything in England or Normandy of the same class and period. And I'm going to bed as soon as we're finished. It is interesting to remark that the first Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland occurred in AD 1171 to 72, 37 years later than the act of consecration referred to. At Cashel, the perfect round tower, Cormac's chapel, the magnificent cathedral founded by Donna O'Brien, King of Thomond, circa uh, 1152, the ancient castle of the archbishops, Hoar Abbey, situated upon the plain immediately beside the rock, and the numerous crosses and other remains afford most valuable studies for the architectural architectural ang afford most valuable studies for the architectural antiquary or the artist. See, it's not that difficult, Anthony. <laughs> it can be done. What time are we on? Twenty three minutes past. Uh, hope uh, that uh, you all enjoyed that um, and uh, don't forget to uh, uh, check in on the main Mythical Ireland Facebook page and the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. Um, I met a zombie who doesn't joke around. <laughs> yes, he's dead serious. And in uh, another development this week, I got fired from the keyboard factory. My boss says I wasn't putting in enough shifts <laughs> and I completely lost control, <laughs> CTRL. Oh, never mind. If you're explaining, you're losing. Anyway, that is the reading for this evening. Uh, who are we saying hello to? Um. Somebody is saying, always enjoy readings on the Mythical Learning Community, which is, oh, that's Michael Pike. Yes. Always enjoy the readings, but maybe not the jokes. If you want to support Mythical Ireland, folks, uh, a little appeal, as always, please consider becoming a patron of Mythical Ireland at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, where you get access to extras, extra bits and pieces and uh, you get to support uh, the work uh, that's done here anyway um if there's any questions or comments i'll hang around for a few minutes i don't have to uh, fly out the door or anything like that um always glad to and a special hello to uh, uh david clark in dublin and uh, not david clark in Ishnock, different david uh, who says he's a big fan of the channel, uh, but his messages don't appear on the live streams for some reason. And I'm not sure why that is. Uh, probably YouTube being glitchy. You're an inspiration and a wonderful source of old stories. You and Eddie Lennon, Lennon are uh, national treasures. 
<laughs> oh, I don't think I could be put on the same pedestal as Eddie, in fairness. Um, but uh, thanks, uh, David. I'm uh, glad you in, are enjoying uh, the live streams, even though you don't seem to be able to participate. Uh, okay. And the update on the Aurora is overall... Oh, the Aurora Oval is good. Wind speed is good. Solar wind, that is. BZ minus five and bouncing. Still a lot of cloud cover over the country. I'm reading from Night Sky Hunter, who's a very good, <laughs> pardon me, weather and night sky photographer and uh, all round expert. Martin is his name, uh, whom I follow on Facebook. However, re hearing reports of Aurora on camera from Toom and Craig Avon. Breaks in cloud are random, but still a great deal of cloud cover. Long drives to locations, not a good idea unless you're getting prolonged clear skies. So if you're in Ireland, uh, probably in Britain as well, uh, um, and you've got clear skies, do look to the north and see if you can see the Aurora Borealis. Do you know? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, Spike, you need to have a YouTube account to comment. So maybe it's just that he's watching on YouTube, but he doesn't actually have an account or he's not logged in. Yeah, maybe that's the case. Um, I, must, uh, I must say that to David. Glad to get off work uh, a bit early and catch this today, says Valerie Gallagher. Thanks, Anthony, and great to see all the two in good form. Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, as always, a great pleasure for me to host uh, this uh, weekly uh, gathering and... Um, yeah, um, always enjoyable from my point of view. Wayne Bird, great night as always, Anthony. Sleep well, everyone. I need a bit of extra last night because I got a little bit less last night. Ne ne nearest train station to Cashel is Thurles. How far is that in terms of um, uh, journey time? Is that like 10 minutes? Is that half an hour? I should know, shouldn't I? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so not a million miles away i suppose yeah um i have to catch up from the start sounds a really interesting episode tonight yes i hope you, uh, you enjoy that uh, adrian it'll be available to re-watch as soon as i finish broadcasting your 20 to 30 minutes says on your ryan 30 minutes says helena brain yeah uh I, i've been in cashel and i've stayed there uh lovely place actually uh thank you elaine and enjoy that 22 celsius oh man you you've definitely got a couple of degrees to spare send them to the colder folks please do mighty broadcast announces tom king enjoyed that thank you Auntie and friends of the two take care my friends until next time and you as well tom and uh, you've been a very busy 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 boy lately but um uh, all all for the good as the man says all for the good right uh if there's no other questions or comments kathy may will watch the rest tonight brilliant enjoy the rest of your lunch break kathy may thanks erica you're very welcome uh, joe o'keefe i was late tonight well you have no choice now you have to go back to the start and watch <laughs> from the beginning Ikawa, uh, uh and that's from adrian and Barb, thank you, Barb, are one of those, certainly, who watched the very first episode. And we're coming up. We're not far off. We're about two weeks away now from three years since the beginning of all this. But anyway, um, hopefully we don't go back to any of that again. Um, lockdowns and stuff like that. Is that a dozen busies? Uh, I'm not sure what that question means. And that's, is that Michael again? I'm not sure who that is. Apologies. That a dozen busies. That's Michael asking. Gromagut. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Sloan, Gafol, Spike Willow, Sloan, and uh, Desiree. Have a great week. Yeah, you too. Stay nice and snuggled, snuggled up and warm with Amadeus there. Stay away from the cold. And uh, hopefully summer is on its way for all of us before too long. Three years. Yeah, I know. Three years on the 12th of March. Yeah. I mean, seriously, where is the time going? Wow. But anyway, uh, a lot of very, very nice things have happened in that time too, you know. 
So I'll say good night, and we shall. Derek Hollingsworth uh, logged in late myself. Thanks for the interesting content, longer Fold. Thank you, Derek, and same to you. A very good night, Ihoa. And all that remains for me to say, you helped me survive COVID through the astounding nerdy jokes, says Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, I helped myself survive by convincing myself I had a sense of humor. <laughs> all that remains for me to say is, Ihoa, Kolosov, Slongafol. And most importantly of all, Togabugay, until.